Simon, Jason, it would be business as usual for us to skip over and ignore Roman Gonzalez who fought last night. And most people probably don't remember that he was fighting last night. They didn't watch it. They didn't get a chance to see it because maybe if you did want to see him or you did know, you probably couldn't find the link or some way to watch that fight. And it's a crime because Gonzalez's talent warrants a lot of discussion. And a lot of people out there, they're always asking, what kind of fighter should I watch that would personify aggressiveness and they're they're brutal in the ring, but yet it's somehow beautiful and they're technically sound and all of those things. And you say, it's Roman Gonzalez. Mm. Just stop. It's Roman Gonzalez. This is the guy you want to watch. And yeah, there's a rumor he's coming to HBO in May and you shouldn't miss out on that. But we saw Gonzalez's fight last night. Simon, why don't you start? What did you see? It was a good, I think it was apparent even from their records that he was woefully underprepared for the fight. Um, not, not Gonzalez. Um, it, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, um, Roman was like, sort of keeping him, keeping him standing. It's like, he didn't maybe go as hard as he could have just to get a couple rounds out of the guy. Absolutely. That first round was clearly Gonzalez trying to at least have this fight go more than one round. He didn't come out guns blazing. He came out measured and it looked like he might have been out there trying to work on a couple of things. Yeah, Obviously, well. his opponent was way overmatched. Big, like just massive respect to Valentin Leon. You lasted three rounds with Roman Gonzalez. Um, you got low blowed a couple of times, although I was actually watching it from a video camera that was converted to on VHS and to <laughs> six different um, types of conversions for me to see that through that terrible stream that we watched last night so who knows yeah, if those are low blows it's a pity they don't get better coverage uh, it, no one in the uk picked that up i don't think any u.s broadcaster picked it up oh, um no. it's just it's just terrible to get a hold of but yeah i feel like roman was probably just making the most of it in terms of putting something on that the fans would enjoy locally yeah, within the arena yeah, this was a free event as well, so it was kind of like a oh, I didn't know that. kind of thing. Yeah, where all of his fans could come out, and it was um, free to the public. So all of his mm. supporters were there. It was a you know a big deal for him. So I'm sure he wanted to carry the guy a little bit to put on a little bit of show. You know, well, that's it. For it all the fans that came out. If it's the headlining act that people have come out for, you don't want it to be over in like 14 seconds yeah, and which, you know, everyone go home. Exactly, which would especially if do. they had to order it on pay per view, that would not be a good thing, now would it? No, exactly. But yeah, no, I mean, especially for... if the main eventer wasn't actually on that card because he got injured and you were left with the cone main event, main event as the main event. But that's a whole other conversation. I think we're getting into. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, no, it was it was good to see him. I I, I hope that the uh, rumors with HBO do come to fruition. Um, and I think that it's kind of. You're quite likely, but given everything else that's going on in the landscape at the minute, it wouldn't surprise me if HBO were looking to pick up a couple new people here and there to get some more interest. Not not that they're lacking, but you know, there's there's threats in the water now to to steal away some audience. So, yeah, it would make sense for them to be doing some things to try and uh, you know explore other avenues and grow some more some more fighters. Yeah, it feels to, it feels to me like Gonzalez has been like this ace in the hole that everyone is at access to. And, and the landscape has just been that nobody needed to reach for him. And with Heyman making his big play, and we're going to see how that plays out this weekend, Gonzalez is finally going to be pulled out. Like, like it's, we're finally ready to pull out the big gun, and we're going to see how he does. But let me ask you guys this. If he's coming to HBO in May, who do you want to see him fight? Or, and what do you think is most likely... Well, it's most likely going to be a showcase fight for him, in my opinion. It's going to be his first time on the network. They're going to want to ensure that you get to see the Chocolatito that you've seen in the past, right? The explosive, come-forward fighter who is, you know, all the superlatives that you gave him at the top of the show. So I don't necessarily think he's going to be uh, in the most competitive fight, but... You know, I certainly could be wrong, but I think it will probably be more of a showcase uh, type fight for his first appearance, at least. Or they might try to do him trial by fire, you know, because uh, he's not somebody that they would typically have on their airwaves. They they may do that approach. Mm. And is he someone that was looking at stepping up for his next one? Was, am I am I getting that right? The the thought there, I haven't 
gotten a direct quote from him from any source, but the the idea there was that his next fight was likely going to be yeah, I don't know if it would be like a step up fight or anything, but it'd be like a fight where you can get excited about it, where he's going to have an opponent that's not live, but like legitimately close to his level. Mm. The rumor back then when Gonzalez to HBO rumors first started flying out was that they were interested in the Juan Francisco Estrada rematch. They um, right. had had Estrada on their network too, albeit it was on HBO 2 on the Zushi Ming undercard. How And we'll get to him later too. However... If you're going to make a sell of Gonzalez, there's no better fighter that you're going to put him with other than Estrada because you know that's a fight that went 12 rounds before. You have replay footage and highlight footage so you can make a reel of what you can expect from these two guys, which is a really good fight. And there's also the threat that Gonzalez, who's a bigger guy now, might stop Estrada. Now, the fight that I want to see, though, is Naoya Inoyu which um, Gonzalez has made it clear that that's a fight that he's angling toward. He'd have to move up a division, and there's probably a bunch of logistical stuff to work out because that fight is no doubt happening in Japan. And I don't yeah. see HBO being uh, willing, you know? If he could establish himself, though, in Superfly, which I don't think he's going to struggle at at the end of the day, um, you can find someone that's like got some good promotion already but isn't too big a challenge, someone like Paul Butler maybe. Um, if you wanted to step up to to test the water with him, you've got enough people to watch that. I think that it makes promotional sense. So yeah, there, there's there's options for him to move up. You're mean, Paul Butler or Paul Butler? Butler, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably not a fight that Butler wins. No, no, I I don't think so at all. But I think it's one that would. I mean, if you scour the top sort of twenty, thirty at Superfly and think who it is you want to test the water with, he's probably the safest and most watched fighter in in those ranks, just because he's got a good amount of like UK domestic support. So I I, I think yeah, it'd get it'd do good numbers and be a relatively risk free fight for Gonzalez to go up. Yeah, that's that's. There's no doubt about that, especially given that he is the most watched fighter in that division given his platform you know obviously i'd rather see him fight inoyu or even quadras but i really think that if they're gonna sell a gonzalez fight in america to the american audience because we're talking about hbo here he's gonna have to fight estrada he's gonna have to fight quadras it has to be um something that yeah. the audience knows and is, is familiar with and what they're familiar with with those two fighters is mexican fighters and we know that mexican fighters have a reputation for being good, for putting on a show. Yeah, I think that's true. And if if he was to stop them in you know in explosive fashion, then yeah, absolutely, it gives him that that signal boost to be able to get something bigger on. Just as in in fact, even more sensational than uh, Gonzalez's performance last night was Frampton's performance in the daytime. I don't know that there has been a more impressive, more dominant, and complete performance all year long so far than what Frampton did to Chris Avalos yesterday. What did you guys see? What what made Frampton so special last night? And if there are people who are still not sold on Frampton, what do you tell them? Ooh, go yeah. back and watch that fight. <laughs> I think, honestly... Well, that that man, would help. That, yeah, I mean, uh, that fight was... He was absolutely stunning in that fight. Uh, he, he really... Um, he made me a believer, that's for sure. Um... It's this combination of just explosive punching power, being able to place his punches very well, and I think he is uh, spectacular with his balance. He's rarely out of balance. He's not throwing these wide whiffing shots. His shots just have a ton of power on him, and that just comes from where he's able to keep his feet. He has this fantastic uh, you know, foot placement, which keeps himself in balance, keeps him able to hit hard with every shot, and he's just, he's a fantastically fun fighter to watch, too. Like, uh, you know, Nothing's very slow. He's very technical. Everything is, uh, you know, happening really quickly. And I just, uh, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to find somebody um, that that wasn't entertained by him. Yeah, it was a, a clinical performance. I, I worried that it was going to be a much shorter night than it was. I thought that it could have been a bit overmatched. But to his credit, uh, Avalos was there. I don't know. He wasn't there to lie down. He just wasn't good enough on the night. I think. No, it's it. 
yeah, it's um, it's been good to to see what he's doing so far. In in terms of what it's done for his ranking and that, I think with box rec now he's he's jumped up to the top position and overtaken Rigondo on on their little yes. metric points. Yeah, it's it's an amazing one. And and listening to David Hay went into the dressing room afterwards, and when he was talking to them, he uh, made a comparison that Rigondo would have taken Avalos on points, but he wouldn't have been able to get him out of there, and that therefore. Frampton beats Rigondo in as far as he's concerned and I thought I that was that. an interesting commentary yeah I don't necessarily agree with that either yeah, that's I, true. Thought was, I thought it was an interesting comparison just you know just because someone's knocking someone out quicker or you're doing it on points I think it's sort of apples to oranges it's not necessarily yeah, I mean, gonna mean styles make fights I mean we should know better than that at this point yeah it's the old cliche but yeah I I, I don't know I I, I would have if you'd have asked me a week ago Rigondo Frampton I'd have been really confident on a Rigondo points win I'm I haven't changed from that opinion but I'm a lot less confident of it yeah he swayed my opinion last night a lot I thought it would have been a very comfortable uh, clear decisive victory from Rigondeau uh, but Rigondeau's got a little bit of a shaky chin he absolutely does and I'm struggling with the knee jerk reaction that we we as boxing fans and sports fans in general tend to have where one little thing and we're already here to make a decision about a fighter as far as their future goes and all that stuff I mean how many times has one guy lost, one lost, and suddenly he's a bum. Yeah, absolutely. There is that that whole polar, you know, you're worthless now because right. you've had one loss. And I think a lot of people are better than that these days. It's 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 not it's not fixed yet, but it's it's getting better, and people are starting to come to terms with the fact that you can pick up some losses and learn from them and come on to be an even better fighter. You're not ruined just because you've been beaten by someone good or, you know, you're not guaranteed the top spot just because you had one stellar performance that, that showcased you. But, but with Frampton, he's been so consistent and I'm, I'd struggle to try and criticize his performance from last night. I can't, you know, even, even try my hardest. I can't really think of too much that he did wrong. Um, at all really to call out. So yeah, I, I, I don't think that it's premature to change our opinion of how, how it'd do against Rigondo. Could you think um, of a more intriguing matchup right now? I can, and I wanted to get to that. But one last thing about Rigondo. I'm not ready to change my opinion on that fight. I think I've always had it that Rigondo would win a unanimous decision, and I still think that. However, I do think that that's probably one of the best fights that you can make in boxing, and whether Frampton upsets him or not, you will get your money's worth if you appreciate the sort of science and the art of boxing. It's probably not going to be a bloodbath, but if you want a bloodbath, then there's Matisse Provodnikov for you. Now, the other thing to answer the the other question, which is, is there a more intriguing matchup than Frampton versus Rigondo? And I think there's one more, and it is reliant on Frampton moving up to featherweight and if he can carry his power. I don't have any doubt that he can carry the other aspects of his game, which make him so good, which is his timing and the way he uses his distance. Now, if he can do that, though, I mean, what would you give to see Frampton versus Lomachenko? That's an interesting pick. Why Loma specifically, of all the people at Feather? I think when it comes to what makes Frampton so good, Lomachenko has the same things in common. Now, Johnny Gonzalez is the champion in the division and the number one guy, and yeah, he's done it on power and knocking guys out and just kind of resiliency. Walters has power, and we've seen a little bit of Walters. We don't really know yet. Lomachenko, we kind of know what we're going to get. We're, he's going to get more and more technical as time goes on, just given his amateur background. And like that's what his, that's the foundation of him. And I think that is just the ultimate sort of, it's just like Rigondo versus Frampton. Same thing. Yeah, it's very yeah. similar. I don't know whether that's doing too much uh, credit for Lomachenko at that point, though. I, he, he's got a lot of people very confident in him. With some, you know, we're talking about someone who's got what five career, you know, five professional fights on win. their record. I never no, even said no, he'd no. be competitive. I, 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 do you think it would be competitive? I don't know. It, it's relying on on Frampton being able to be the same guy at super bantamweight, at featherweight. If he can do that, then you know. All bets are off. I don't know. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it's it, that, that is a mysterious fight in the sense that it's really tough to try and get a handle on what's going to happen because we've seen so little of Lomachenko in the professional capacity. You know, it's not that we, we've got a big picture of him in terms of what he's going to do when he's in X, Y, and Z situation. So it's a really difficult one to analyze. Well, let me ask you this. So first of all, in boxing, the best matchups are always the ones where the winner isn't clearly defined. Now, sometimes there, when it's clearly defined and the other guy makes it interesting because he's competitive when he, no one expected him to, that's great too. But mm. on paper right now, that fight is just a mystery and we know it's going to be highly technical for, or you know, we can say however long it lasts. That fight to me is just fascinating. We know how Rigondeau Framto is likely going to go. Yeah, I, I totally agree that it, it is more of a mystery and it's more of a, an unknown variable. And so finding out what actually goes down on the night would be a huge draw. So yeah, I, I agree with that from that point of view, definitely. And it's more unknown because you have a couple factors. You have the moving up in weight and then you have Lomachenko. Loma Loma <laughs> right, exactly. And how he's going to be able to manage that fight. It's very intriguing matchup. I don't know if I would put it past uh, the Rigondeaux fight. But I, I think they're both right there with each other as far as like some of the best fights that I hope we get this year later on. So we talked about mystery and all that stuff. For my money right now, there isn't a more mysterious fighter, to me at least, than Tyson Fury. And I know mm-hmm. we're, just, we're just jumping right off of the topic and into the next one, but we got a lot of things to talk about. And Fury is just a mystery to me right now because there's, he's showing so much, and yet I feel like there's so much I still don't know. What did you guys think of, first of all, yeah, what did you guys think last night of um, his fight with Christian Hammer? Simon, you love Fury, so why don't you go? Okay. Uh, (laughs) Sorry, Jason, I didn't mean to do that. It was the same time. Go ahead, Simon. Love's love's a strong word, but I I am a fan, definitely, and and I think that because of his out-of-the-ring antics and because of the way he carries himself, I, I think people think that he's a sort of novelty, gimmicky, you know, performer that is you know is going to get exposed by someone at some point um I, I don't necessarily agree with that i think that his corner are ridiculously good you know when you, if you take the time to listen to the things that his corner do they they're always so intelligent with their analysis of stuff and they they'd called it from day one that hammer was going to be coming in looking to to land giant overhand right bombs and that you know anything other than that wasn't going to work so that they he'd be spending david hay <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it, 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 it's funny cuz um for me, Hammer last night looked like Chisora did against Hay, because that was exactly what Chisora did uh, many moons ago when he came up against Hay. He was just looking for that giant swooping over the top right, hoping to get lucky. And so it, it came down to Fury was just um, you know keeping his distance, working on the back foot, switching stance, just twisting him, and, and got his work done. So I, I, I think it was a really good technical performance. It looked a little bit dry and boring at parts in terms of like, because it wasn't always on fire and it wasn't always electric. But I think it, it's, again, almost every fight we've seen from Fury in the last couple of years, he's added another you know, string to his bow and said, you know, I can also do this, I can also do this. And he's just showing us how much there is there because it's, de- it's depthier than people will give him credit for, I think. Jason, yeah, I not. think, yeah, I was going to say, I think if I read it correctly from yesterday, you weren't that high on Fury's performance or you weren't that impressed. Did I read that correctly? Yeah, you absolutely did. I thought the most impressive thing was his ring walk selection, which was <laughs> rather <laughs> impressive. Uh, but beyond that, it was, um, he seemed like a guy who didn't really get up for this fight, who wasn't very interested in his opponent, who didn't feel like he had much to prove. And, uh, he fought that way, in my opinion. He was, um, you know, he looked a little bit out of shape, but he kind of looks like that most of the time. Mm. So I'm interested to see, wh- is he going to change that kind of attitude and get up once he has the big fight? Because he was definitely fighting like someone who was just not intrigued by what was in front of him and felt as though it was an irrelevant matchup. Yeah, I think that he probably did feel that way too, and he probably. You know, I think all of your your comments there are correct. You know, he didn't think that it was a fight worthy of his time, and he viewed this as a stay busy fight. This was a glorified sparring session day out for him, I think, in his head. So, you right. know, was he putting his all into his camp? Probably not. And he, right. he, I think he was just looking to try some stuff out. You know, get the um, 
Elvis impersonator in. You know, he's a showman at the end of the day. He looks to <laughs> he put really on a show. He really is a showman. Oh, it's it's fantastic. Anytime the announcing crew has to talk about uh, someone being on a leave from jail in order to, you know, be in the <laughs> camp, it, you you won me over. Yeah, he's um, he he's a good showman. He knows his promotional game, and it, it, you know sometimes you can let that distract from the fact that he he can box. He's got he's not a, like a knockout artist or someone that's that's relied on one thing. He's very versatile. So you know, are there better heavyweights right now? Yeah, absolutely, there are a couple, but not many. It'll take you know, it does take something a bit special, I think, to to dethrone him. He's good off the back foot. Uh, you know, he, he spends a lot of time moving backwards, trying to time people coming in, it seems like. Uh, the thing that he has these very interesting reactions when uh, Hammer was, like, coming forward at him, where he would almost, like, kind of paw and, like, flail his arms in front of him, like he was a little overwhelmed by being rushed in at. So mm. uh, it's just, uh, I noticed that a couple times, like, as his back was hitting the ropes and, um, Hammer was moving in on him. He just had some very odd reactions. It, but that just goes to his kind of unique style because he definitely has a very unique style. Yeah, yeah. I, in, in my opinion, I could be wrong here. This is all speculation. But I think that they deliberately decided that this fight, he was going to show that he can resist the temptation to get into an all-out trading, you know, dig himself into the trenches and go blow for blow and get him out of there early. I think they decided that this fight, what they wanted to do was show that he can be patient, stick to his boxing, outpoint someone by being a better boxer and not relying on just having to go toe to toe and trade with someone who's, who's a lesser puncher. And as a result, we, you know, it, it, I, I think if he'd wanted to, he could have probably traded early and got rid of him, but it wasn't game plan tonight. And they wanted to show something a bit different to what they've you know shown us in the past. Yeah, I'm in the middle with you guys because on one hand, I can see what Fury's doing. And the whole thing about flailing his arms, I read that as him trying to do a Vladimir Klitschko. Now, there's no one better in boxing, really, apart from a few, than Vladimir Klitschko is at somehow using his arms to weather a storm when his opponent is raging forward towards him to calmly keep this guy at distance, counter when he's ready, and then move out of the way so that this guy isn't cornering you. Um, so I can see that he was doing that, now, I, or at least that's what it looked like to me. Um, and I think a lot of it comes down to your expectation, because I was looking for myself, like, why am, am I not convinced that Fury is legitimate? And for me, it's I have an expectation with Fury where... I see Fury like the way he was when he was getting a lot of guys out. He was aggressive. And that's my expectation of how I think Fury should be fighting. But Fury's actually not, like, he's doing things differently now. He's much more patient. He's trying to box. He's trying things out in the ring. And what I'm really, what I think is happening is that they're trying to prepare Fury for a big fight. And these opponents are like live sparring matches. And it's a shame that that's happening because, you know, I mean, well, it's not like you have to pay for these fights. It's not on a pay-per-view. Um, and it's not like he's knocking them out in like 20 seconds or anything. But I think Fury's preparing for Wilder. I really think that's that's what's happening. Wilder's going to come in with stuff like that. And Fury's got to weather him. Mm. And if he somehow gets that Klitschko fight as Frank Warren claims is happening, all the better. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in terms of like um, preparing for a big fight... Definitely is. He has been for years now. You know, he, he he thinks he's due on already. I mean, he's been messed about by Hay in the past with with various injuries, and you know, not to assign blame one way or the other. But the the bottom line is, he's been in a position for a big fight for a long time, and for one reason or another, they keep not materializing. He's been mandatory for a while now, and there's there's no real interest other than what Frank Warren's said. And I'm not <laughs> sure how much stock to put in on that one. I don't know. I can't imagine Klitschko signed off on that just yet. I mean, he did say, Frank Warren, that if, if he gets through Jennings, that this summer that fight will get made. But I, I think it's that Frank that was Warren. More, yeah, I think that he was more speaking his desires than, you know, because, you know, f for Vlad, he's going to get through Jennings I mean, by, yes, all, by all accounts. Yeah. And um, I can't see him doing anything other than trying to get unified at that point and trying to pin down Wilder. So and if at that point if you're Wilder and you want to keep hold of that belt and not lose it to Klitschko, you're going to have to put something on half credible, 
and at that point you probably need someone like Fury to come and you know do a defense with that the the WBC will let you do um and at, you know at the same point it gets you out of having to go and lose to Klitschko so yeah i i think that that one is is likely possibly by the end of the year um so Tyson Fury arguably depending on who you ask he's le- he is definitely a top 5 heavyweight in the world and you could make the case that he's in the top 3 the one question i have though is why hasn't Fury fought Tony Thompson. <laughs> yeah, there I, I, is no fighter out there that's going to prepare him for. Or I mean, Tony Thompson is like the top of the heavyweight uh, division's gatekeeper. Hmm. You, if you do, if you do not beat Tony Thompson, you do not deserve a, a shot at Vladimir Klitschko. So, what's the deal with Fury not fighting him? I I don't know, but I from a promotional point of view, he is a banana skin. Uh, he's going to trip you up because he's not viewed as a great heavyweight for one reason or another, but he is a great heavyweight. You know, it, you're probably going to lose to him. I, I don't know who I fancy in that fight, possibly Thompson, though. And I don't think that you get a lot of props from most people for getting the win there because they'll say, oh, it's some old, irrelevant heavyweight. So what? But the, the fact is, that's that's one of the toughest fights in heavyweight right now. Tony Thompson doesn't mess about. He's he's a you know a veteran with a huge skill set, and he beats most heavyweights out there. Not called Klitschko. Yeah, oh, yeah. All, the fight's he, got spoiler written. Even though he lost two. Yeah, and then he, he. I mean, he just made Odlanier Solis quit. He was mm. handsomely winning on that fight, and he made him quit. Thompson. I think Thompson is a top five heavyweight. I am. Um, if you want to make the case that he's not, let's do this. But I don't think you want to because, I mean, who's better than Tony Thompson, other than Vladimir Klitschko, other than Kubrat Pulev who beat him? Although that was a close. I mean, you can't say it was a close fight. It was more like, did anybody want to win that fight? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a it was a reticent fight from both of them, wasn't it? Then neither of them were committed it was an odd sort of cagey one but in a rematch I don't know that I think that it will necessarily go the same way again I think that Thompson could win a rematch of that one so you know I'd, I'd, I'd hear your argument that Pulev's better than Thompson at the minute but I don't, you know I, that, that's really really tight I think it could be either way around yeah and, and Thompson's I mean in America he's underappreciated and it's most and it's a shame because he's, he's an entertaining guy he's called um Deontay Wilder, some not nice names on live TV. And uh, I, I think if Wilder and Klitschko are going to fight each other, which looks like that's what Vladimir wants to do after he beats Jennings, Fury's got to fight Thompson because that's the most entertaining fight we're going to get. Yeah, Before and it's sad rates. that that people have got bigger paydays and fought for better titles and have done less than, than Fury has. <laughs> and he's he's probably sat there thinking, why on earth I've paid the, the you know the Jews have been paid three times over. Where's my big payday fight? Why have I got to go and fight Thompson in what will probably be a low paying fight that's it's not going to be a, in, it's not going to do massive numbers. It's going to be a really tough fight, probably the the hardest fight of his career by quite a, a long way. And why has he got to do that? And well, because it proves to everyone that he's at world level. If he yeah. can get by, that's why he has to do it, because there's no one else out there that he's fighting that's going to challenge him in the same ways that Thompson is going to. It's yeah. not that he hasn't paid his dues yet, in my opinion, all the way to the top. Like, get by Thompson, show us some serious skill, and then we could talk. You know, it's like I mean, the welterweight division, the heavyweight right now. Like, if you think about it, they're all doing the same thing where everybody's trying to do the least amount of work possible so that they can get their shot exactly. at Vladimir. Yeah, and, and you know, Ariola gets a Klitschko shot. Leopai gets a Klitschko shot. And Fury's there like, really? I have to go in the trenches with Thompson now? And I think, yeah, you do. But it, it, it's unfortunate. It's, it's just the way that the, the promotional game works at the end of the day. Yeah, people have uh, done less and gotten more, but think of the exclamation point that he'll put on his career if he beats Thompson. Yeah, that's a huge if, though, isn't it? I don't know how much I fancy him (laughs) in that fight. Well, then, if you can't get by Thompson, what are you trying to do in the ring with Klitschko? Yeah, absolutely. I I don't think that there's 
anyone really who's going to be backing Fury as a favourite to take that with Klitschko. But I like him over Wilder. That's why I want him to go in the direction of Wilder because I do I do fancy his chances in that fight. Yeah, that's a much different and much more interesting route, in my opinion, as well. I would it's going to be a good payday. Those. It's going to put you know a, a world belt around him. It's yeah, Plus, it's, it's, it's just it's such wonderful. a spoiler. <laughs> like he's just, yeah, he it, it is. The banana skin of the heavyweight division, Absolutely. as Price found out, you know, you, you, he's tough. What was his name? Huh? David Who's this? David <laughs> David Twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I David thought you Twice. were making a joke that he's not relevant anymore. I was going to say that's too far. <laughs> no, I, 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 I rewatched the uh, Thompson Price fights this weekend as well, out oh, of a, a nostalgia sense. Yeah, yeah. It was, they, they're good. It just Thompson shows how, um, how hearty he is because if you watch yes. in the second one price is arguably winning the rounds up until that point and there's a couple points where thompson looks like he's in trouble but he just brushes it off and gets back to work he's he's that resilient yeah and yeah. just resiliency chris eubank jr who eubank jr shocked the hell out of me last night when um if you didn't see the fight uh, or know who Chris Eubank Jr. is, he's a son of a British legend, much like Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. And Eubank Jr. lost a fight against another un- like another top undefeated prospect out there in his last fight. So what did they do? They threw him in with another undefeated prospect, this time with a paper title. And Eubank Jr., uh, what do you call it when somebody has very little technical skill and guts it out anyway despite having an inclination to brawl every chance that they're dragged into one. Somebody who's not going to make it far against elite competition? Yeah, he's probably not. Yeah. But what he does, what he will do is be entertaining. He's got a tremendous amount of heart. His chin is pretty good. I mean, the shots that he was taking while throwing other shots too, mm. leaving himself wide open, it was ridiculous. And he, he got hurt a couple of times but didn't go down. Yeah, I mean, he takes a he takes a lot of punishment to give a little bit, but like you said, entertaining is all get up, and I think he's got the right last name to go really far with that combination of uh, you know entertaining entertainment power, and he's got that style where it's almost like Amir Khan, where uh, you just know something dramatic is going to happen, like he could be hurt at any moment, that kind of thing, or his dad could give an interesting. Sort of <laughs> three-word um, pep talk in the corner. And, you know, I think Eubank Jr. is going to be one of those fighters where he's going to be around as long as he wants to be around. But also that every so often, he's going to upset somebody that he shouldn't be beating just mm. because of who he is. Because it, that heart and that will to win is so much greater. Now, I just wanted to... Simon went to uh, knew Eubank Jr. because they grew up in the same city. So, Simon, I, I you know him, right? Not not on a, a great basis, but yeah, we um, played football and that together as as young uns. He's um, he, his his boxing career has been interesting so far, and I think that I don't know he's possibly been a victim of his own fame in the sense that because he's known so you know so prominently because of his last name, he's got put in the limelight very early, and as a result, I don't know whether he's been able to hone his craft as well as as other people get the chance to. So he's in this position where he's he's got the tools to do really good stuff and he's you know his chin's good, his heart's good. Um I think that there's ring IQ missing from the fact that he hasn't he hasn't had the the bottom bit of your career that a lot of people do where they're not being seen, they're not necessarily on televised cards, they're you know they're working their way up and honing their craft and I think that that bit might be missing for him there. Um and it must be a frustration as well because for his dad, who had a somewhat similar style, his dad's come the hard way and and you know come up from complete obscurity and you know he he was fighting in, out of New York and things as a sort of unknown fringe person coming through. So he he's gone the hard work way to get Dedication. into that position of lime. Yeah, oh, wait, sorry. To get in to get into that limelight spot. I think he expects his son to have that same level of ring IQ, but he hasn't, hasn't done the necessary steps to achieve it. And so you, you see him doing things that he shouldn't and he got away with them, um, last night, but he won't continue to. No, so, I mean, 
you know, it's a tough one. You you want him to do well, but because he is entertaining, he, he is flashy. He knows he knows his, his promotional knowledge is all excellent. So he, you know he, he'll definitely earn well from boxing. But I think that his achievement possibility it it will just fall short of uh, superstardom purely because of that missing ring IQ. Yeah, he's definitely entertaining, and even a guy like Kodo he can look at Eubank and see a viable opponent because Eubank just has so many flaws that if you're any fighter out there that's above domestic level, you got to think that you can beat Eubank uh, Jr. Mm. Yeah, and, I agree. I agree. And Cotto would have a, a size problem, but I think that he'd be able to you know, get over that with his massive amounts of world-level experience and caliber opposition over the years. I think that if he wasn't able to get by Eubank it would be time to hang him up. Right. Or Eubank got lucky that night because he caught Kodo in the middle of an exchange in round 11. Because I don't really see Eubank winning a decision against Kodo. Just the no. boxing <laughs> IQ, as you've pointed, is just not there. Yeah, and it's, it's not like, you know, they're, they're, I don't want to sound too critical, but you know there are people with much worse ring IQ. But it's the piece that... Oh, is- uh, you should just stop there. Because we're going to talk about the next fight now. Zushi yeah. Ming versus <laughs> I'm Not Ruin Wrong or Ruin Rowing. I don't know how they're going to pronounce it on HBO. Yeah, it should be interesting. I bet you we get at least three different pronunciations. Um, no, did you want to finish that Eubank Jr. thought? I just had to get that joke in. Yeah, I, I think that it's not that he's massively under underprepared or anything. It's just that where he hasn't gone through the relevant due process... His ring IQ isn't what it would be and what a lot of his contemporaries and peers in his group are going to have on him. So do you guys think he has a lot of ability to grow and change as a fighter? Or do you think he's the fighter that we see today is the fighter that he is? That's a really good question. From a personality point of view and with my limited knowledge of him, I think that he's going to be who he is. And he's he'll he'll expand, but he'll basically be a maxed out version of what you're seeing already. So I don't think that they'll be self-aware enough to go into his ring IQ and try and work on that. Yeah, I'll be honest. I've only seen the two fights. I saw the Saunders fight and then I saw the fight uh, yesterday. And he, I don't necessarily see him in terms of how I would label somebody a prospect who's growing from fight to fight and changing and adapting and learning from the mistakes. I kind of just see him as a fighter who's almost set in his ways at a pretty young age. Yeah, no, I totally agree. All right, guys, it's Zhu Ming time. Now, let me give you the details of this fight. So this is Xi Ming's, uh, what is it, his second 12-round fight. They're going to be fighting for Ruin Roing's uh, t- uh, title belt. Now, Xi Ming has beaten him as an amateur. Now, the difference between the two is that Ruin Roing, he's progressed quickly as a pro. He's And he's done the work where he's had uh, however many fights he's had, but he's progressed and he's went through all the steps really quickly. And today this dude stands as a legitimate flyweight champion and he would be competitive with any person in the flyweight division right now and that includes Romy Gonzalez. And I also want to say that I am a... Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Shi Ming. I really like his style um, when he does it correctly, when he doesn't gas out. I think Shi Ming is much better than a lot of people give him credit for. And so I don't feel bad about joking about him. Now, what do you guys think about this fight? Okay, well, that's that's enough for the Shi Ming Ruin Rong discussion. And let's move on. To, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> I know that um, (laughs) impressed a lot of people uh, last year, towards the end of last year. Um, A lot of people were uh, very impressed with his ability. Um, I I don't know. The Shimming fight would be – it's going to be really interesting because – talking about, you know, how we were talking about Lomachenko earlier, Shimming's only got about six pro fights. Is, is, does it seem maybe too early for him for this? Yes. That's what I'm thinking. Like The first thing that screams out to me is maybe he hasn't experienced enough professional styles 
um, in those six fights to really be able to hang in there with uh, Ring Ring. Because <laughs> a lot of times uh, they put Shimming in with like a Mexican brawler who like kind of just comes forward at him. It's not like he's seen this really diverse, wide, wide array of professional styles. Yeah, I, I think he looked a little bit limited against Wang Song Chai Jim. Um, I, 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 I don't nice. know. What's that? said very nice you showed off i know you said that on purpose you <laughs> did obviously he did because otherwise he just would have called him little manny <laughs> yeah, mini, mini manny um yeah no, he um he looked limited i think it was another case of um it, i he wasn't doing the best game plan for the night and it was his ring awareness and his iq again it's another person let down by by iq the, the one that i'm scratching my head with with this fight is that he's such a massive favorite to win this with the bookies and i i'm i'm leaning towards him losing who shimming is a massive favorite shimming yeah, is, is yeah he's like a 2 to 11 on at the moment with most bookies here um, wow they must yeah, know it's, the it's mad. what do well, they know yeah <laughs> this is it so you know 7 to 2 underdog um so explain so, that for people who don't live in the UK, and it's, it's you know uh, if you bet twenty dollars, you'd win seventy dollars and your original twenty back. So if you if you put a bet of twenty on, you'd get ninety in return. Um, for for Shimming to lose, that is so, and th that's I, I think it's way more likely than that. I I can't really account for what's happened unless someone you know. Th the only thing I can think is that massive amounts of Chinese betting supporters have flooded the bookies with bets on Xi Ming and it's made him seem the favorite by the way that the odds have slid. Look, I agree completely with you in that Xi Ming should not be the favorite here. I've watched both of these fights. I've seen every single one of Xi Ming's fights and I've gone back and watched them again and I've seen Ruin Rong, Ruin Rong <laughs> fight enough times to know that he's the clear favorite here. Ru Ruin Rowing fights like a legitimate professional fighter. The amateur style is completely gone with him. Now, the only thing with him where I would say is even a flaw going into this fight is that he has a tendency to, um, I guess it's kind of like what Bradley does where he does enough. Like if you hit him two times, he knows now I'm going to hit you three times or at least come back with two. Mm. So he's always like he, it's almost like he always wants to get the last word. Like if it was an argument now, that's had him have some close fights so far. And if he does that with Shi Ming and lets Shi Ming lead, I don't think he can hit Shi Ming because he's actually pretty elusive when he boxes. Now, the problem is that Shi Ming forgets that he's boxing and wants to brawl, and that's where Freddie Roach's hair gets even grayer. I think that if it becomes that kind of fight, Shi Ming has a chance, and he could probably outpoint... Ruin wrong. I mean, he was a, a double gold medalist for that reason because he can mm. outpoint people. Yeah, I, I the way I see it with this one, this fight is Ruin Roang's to lose. Absolutely. I mean, and I mean, going in right now, he's there's no way I like I cannot fathom how he doesn't beat Shi Ming unless it's some wacky scorecards. Yeah, and that, that's 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 definitely a possibility. But I mean. For um, for his sake, you know, as long as he wants to win this and he comes in with the right game plan and he stays smart, I don't see him losing. I mean, and this is very likely to go to the, the the distance at this point too with the two of these guys, right? Yeah, I think so. It's a safe bet. No. Um, Ruin Rong hasn't knocked a guy out um, since the summer of 2013. Shiming knocked a guy out. Because the referee pushed him down, I think what ha is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that was the Cotto Rodriguez fight. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> so, Shiming, sh sh I mean, this is completely Ruin Rong's fight to lose. Now, let's switch gears. But oh, by the way, this is going to be an interesting fight, though. For those of you thinking that this is not going to be a good fight or entertaining, it actually, I, I really think this is going to be a really good fight. Shimming is going to come out guns blazing, and there's going to be a lot of action in, in the beginning of the fight. There are going to be some adjustments being made, and by the end of the fight, I think we should get a really good fight out of this one. But enough about that. Uh, we'll get, we're going to get Al Heyman's debut this weekend of the Premier Boxing Champion Series on NBC, and we've got 
Adrian Broner versus John Molina in the co-headliner. Yes, you have. John Molina, we we're talking about betting lines and stuff. Molina's the clear underdog, right, guys? There's no chance for... Yeah, yeah, I think Molina's yeah, absolutely. considered an underdog in this fight, absolutely. Now, but is that fair, like, to have him as a massive underdog to Adrian Broner? Massive, no. Um, underdog, yes. I don't think he's that far out of his league. Uh, and, you know, he's got the power to bail him out. So I wouldn't, I would never really count Molina out. He's one of the funnest fighters to watch just for that reason alone. But as yeah. far as if I'm setting odds, yeah, I'm going to say he's, he's an underdog uh, to Broner. Let the me throw this out here, there. The script for this fight is going to be Broner winning by points. And he's going to have to work very hard for it because Molina's not going to give it to him on a plate. So he's going to be dragging him into the trenches and making him... His face is going to show that he's been in a war, but I think it'll be a comfortable points win for Brona by, when, it, when it's all said and done. But he will, it will have some markings by the end of it. Yeah, I who agree do you guys, that. Who do you guys think is the biggest underdog here? Guerrero. Robert Guerrero, John Molina, or John Pascal? Pascal by Guerrero. a country mile. Guerrero by two country miles. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're both yeah. wrong. Molina's the biggest underdog of those of those three. Really? I don't agree. I don't agree. Well, well go on. that's what, because what? people underestimate Molina throughout his entire career, and that's just happening again. That's all. Well, he's taken two bad losses coming to the into this fight. You guys aren't gonna weigh that. Broner's taken two bad wins. I mean, <laughs> I, okay. He hasn't looked spectacular in his last couple fights. I thought yeah. his, I thought he finished the Taylor fight strong, but let me throw this one out to you guys too. I think a lot of people are relating to Molina the same way they relate to Pacquiao now where he's 2009 Pacquiao when that was a long time ago. And people think that the Molina that showed up for the Mickey Bay 10th round and the Lucas Matisse fight is the guy who we can expect on Saturday. And if you saw him in the Humberto Soto fight, you know, didn't look great. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, but in, in terms of th th this is a kid who's been trying to forge a pro career and earn well from it for a long time. This is his, his night. This is, you know, he's going to want to look better than all of his previous performances combined. This is the one chance he's got to showcase himself to an enormous audience on you know, public free television, no pay-per-view. It, it's going to go out to a very broad audience and put him on the map. And I, I, I can't see him coming in unmotivated to, uh, you know, next weekend. Now, yes. he can come in as motivated as he wants. Do you guys see him winning? Um, By any way other than a, a, a one-shot knockout. Well, here's no, the thing. No, okay. And with yeah. that clarification, no. I think that he, he, he. I don't think that that's impossible, though. You know, Brown has shown that he can be caught and he can be tagged. Yeah, I think it's close to. I think it would. It's it's pretty far fetched. Uh, Broner, whatever you want to say about him, he showed that he has a spectacular chin in the Maidana fight. Mm -hmm. uh, he was getting touched really uh cleanly you know obviously he went down a couple times but he got back up does john molina have um my donna power a donna power i don't think so i reckon I, I i it's not so much about the power i think it's the way that he, he picks his angles and shots anyone who can put matisse on the canvas especially as quickly as he did several it, times yeah he's um I, I don't think he's to be trifled with and i, I think you can expect to see Broner meet the canvas at least once in the fight Ooh. Well, that will make for a great fight. That will, be, that will make for a great fight. I'm not sure I see uh, Broner hitting the canvas. I, I, I respectfully disagree. Yeah, no, it, it's very <laughs> possible, but I don't know. I, I got a hunch. Guys, um, this weekend is a big weekend for me because I have a bunch of my favorite fighters who are fighting. We have Broner, who is one of my favorite fighters, and I know a lot of people are rolling their eyes or whatever. I don't care. Broner's fighting. She means... I love to watch. He's fighting. We got Luke Campbell fighting. Evian Kitrov, who we're going to talk about a little later, is going to fight on Friday Night Fights. It's tough for me. I want to say that Broner is going to come in here and he's going to light Molina up. That's how I feel on sort of an emotional level. I, I, I saw what Matisse did to him, and I saw how Humberto Soto, I, what, he's like 64 years old, and he, what, he, he beat Molina pretty decisively in that fight. 
I don't think yeah. Molina really like. I agree with the with the line where it's at. Uh, I I I I'm confident that Broner will take this, but I, it, as I said, Molina's going to make him work for it, and I think that we'll see him get into a couple of heated exchanges. Yeah, the, one last thing on this, which uh, you said that Mol- Molina's going to come in prepared because he's on this big stage and it's you know NBC whatever. Yep, Broner is like he thrives on this stuff. This is a huge stage for AB. And if he's going to be always balling about billions, he's got to start on Saturday and he has to tear Molina apart. Yeah, but it requires him to focus on actually boxing. And there's an AB for him for that night. Well, oh, the other oh, the other thing... Uh, to... Yeah, got me there. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing to look at is the Thurman in the... Um, you know the Thurman card. That that's a showcase fight. Do you think that they Ooh. made the? Let's do this. Do you think that they made the? Um, do you think they made the Broner Molina fight, uh, thinking that it's a showcase fight, but it's like could be a showcase gone wrong kind of thing? Go ahead, Simon. Yeah. So in terms of the Guerrero and, and Thurman fight, I've not followed either of their careers too closely. Um, from their records and achievements, I can't see why it's going to be as one-sided as you guys are leading me to believe. So someone who doesn't know as much about it, what what is it that makes it such a shutout, in your opinion? Well, I think I'm on well, the... hold on. Uh, I I'm never said anything. Shutout. Jason, you're all on your own here. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on the shutout side of things, and I'm definitely a man on my own island uh, when it comes comes to this uh i think you know some people may feel it's rather competitive uh but what are uh what are guerrero's uh greatest achievements in the welterweight division angelo could you just refresh my memory uh well he um he 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 beat andre burdo okay no i said his greatest holding him with one glove holding him with one glove and then hitting him with the other and and fouling him and stuff. That was his greatest achievement. I think he's also um he had a war with Yoshihiro Kamigai and I think um it was like a bloodbath, 12 round sort of both guys weren't able to see at the end of the fight and it was maybe 7 to 5 for Guerrero, but I could hear a draw as well. So what, um, is, what I, I guess let me rephrase it. What has he done well? Accomplishments. What's he, what's he done well at Welterweight? He's, oh, he, he he lost to Mayweather, but uh Mayweather never Knocked him down at least. He didn't go down, but he did get hit a lot. He might have hit Mayweather people, like three times. Yeah, I mean, well, a lot of people don't go down against Mayweather. That's not an accomplishment. He was completely outclassed from, like, Mayweather didn't even need an adjustment period against Guerrero. He just whitewashed <laughs> Like, it was it was hard to watch. Uh, but I, I thought Mayweather had trouble with southpaws. Because Guerrero's a southpaw, right? Yeah, he is. Yeah, doesn't Mayweather have trouble with southpaws? that Let's not go down that road <laughs> oh, because we're talking about a different fight. <laughs> um, but <laughs> so I guess you know my point with standing is that Guerrero has not accomplished a lot at the welterweight finish, welterweight division. He's looked rather lackluster. Whereas I think Thurman is a really dynamic, technical uh, boxer puncher who's just going to completely put the hurt on Guerrero, and he's going to Guerrero's going to look completely out of his league. Th- mm, Guerrero I'm, has these wide winging uh, off balance punches. Thurman's going to be at their telegraph. Thurman's going to be able to see him from a mile away. He's going to make Thurman look great. Yeah, I think that I, I'm starting to believe looking at that. Um, he, he is just so much more established at welterweight looking at it, isn't he? In terms of who he's fought and what he's done. And it looks like Guerrero's jumped straight from light into welter immediately and only done, what, four or five fights at that weight? And one of them being the Mayweather shutout. Am I, am I getting that about right? Yeah, because Guerrero getting was... about right. Yeah, he skipped over a weight class because he was coming up for the Mayweather fight, I think, was the whole was the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, I, I Look, do buy your I, argument. I, I don't know that this is going to be a shutout or a whitewash for Thurman. And I'm not completely confident in saying that. I'm confident in saying that Thurman's winning this fight. Now, I don't know that he's going to knock Guerrero out or disfigure Guerrero's face and leave him looking like the elephant man afterward. But what I am sure of is that this will be a good fight. And this is the kind of fight that 
fans want to see. People were were genuinely excited when this fight got announced, and I think that's what's important here. Is I mean, I'm looking bigger picture here, and if Al Heyman was going to debut a card on NBC that's going to draw in casual fans, what better thing to do than to throw Adrian Broner on there against a guy who has a sellable story? John Molina has done it before. He can do it again. He's actually done it multiple times where he's come out of nowhere against guys that should have easily coasted to victory and shot him. And when he, even when he's lost, he's provided some thrills. And if there's any guy you want to see at least take one knee to the canvas or something, it's Broner. Then the other thing is Guerrero versus Thurman. I mean, it's just it's, it's combustible components that we're putting together with that fight. Now, who knows how competitive it's going to be, though. I'm leaning I towards like... I would believe Guerrero is... Uh, you know, like a live dog in this fight. Yeah. Did I do a good job selling that fight? Yeah, I, I'm I'm pumped for it. I think it's going to be a great weekend. Um, although I, I am that starting to... That was my goal to, there. Yeah, I, 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 I'm definitely excited about, about this card that's coming up, but I'm, I'm starting to feel the need to join Jason on his island, thinking it's going to be one-way traffic. I feel like I need to come with a counter, but there's nothing that I have to counter with that. Uh, I can't make a case for Guerrero being... No, of course you can't. Com- I I think he could be competitive with Thurman. I don't think that he could win a points uh, decision here. I'm just I'm more curious in what is Thurman going to do afterward? Is beating Robert Guerrero enough to earn him a shot at the Mayweather-Pacquiao winner or Mayweather in September? No, I think it would be more of a accomplishment where he would get the winner of like a uh, Con Brook or even maybe may, maybe not that maybe just move on to like a Porter because I'd still love to see Thurman Porter. Yeah, I think he's yeah, got options. Hell of a fight. He's got options and he's got platform, so I, I I don't I don't fear for his future, provided it all goes well for him this weekend. I think that he'll he'll have a number of competitive and intriguing fights, and he's got options. So yeah, I don't, I don't worry about him on that on that front. Let me just state too, I don't think Thurman's going to necessarily knock Guerrero out. I think it will be a distance fight, but I think it will be a you know ten to two, nine to three kind of fight. Yeah, I think that's about right. One last thing about Thurman, we've noticed that Thurman at this highest level isn't his power's not caring anymore. He doesn't like even the punches that he does land that are clean. It doesn't look like he's hurting people anymore. You think that Thurman's power was overestimated as, as he came up and as he stepped onto the world stage, uh, um, you know, he's just kind of realized that, hey, everyone's got power at that level. Or is yeah. there something that Thurman's doing differently? Yeah, I think almost like anyone else, once you start facing the top 10, top 5 of your division, um, they're not going to get knocked out as much because their chins are better. So I don't know that it's something that Thurman's doing differently as much as I think it's his level of competition has been stepped up, and rightfully so. Yeah, and Guerrero... Guerrero's about a step up. It's not a far step, but he is a step up from Leonard Bundu, who... I think I might disagree with that, but you guys can think that. I just wanted to um, touch on something before we start wrapping this up, and I wanted to put some spotlight on a prospect who's going to be fighting this Friday night on Friday Night Fights. And this is, you know, Al Heyman's first sort of Friday Night Fights card. He's got Evgen Kitra fighting, and Kitra's 8 0. He was with Iron Mike Promotions, and whatever happened with Iron Mike Promotions happened, and now all of those fighters are with Heyman. Now, Kitra is, if you're looking for the next Gennady Golovkin, this might be your guy. He has a lot of the same qualities as Golovkin has, although I would lean more towards this guy's kind of like Kovalev, where he's coming in there to put a hurting on. He's not patient, or he's not as patient as Golovkin and isn't sort of using his technical sort of skills that Golovkin uses. And this Friday, you know, people always want to say, oh, Heyman doesn't put his fighters in with competitive guys and he doesn't make them fight anybody. I don't think that's the case. And you're going to, and I've been telling people that this isn't going to be the case going forward, and we're already seeing it. Kitrov is 8 0 and he's knocked out all eight guys. Who knows what this guy's really going to be like as a pro? He's had something like 300 amateur fights and he was very successful. He even won a gold medal at the World Amateur Championships, beating the Olympic gold medalist. And he's going to face Jorge Melendez, who we saw on the Cotto Martinez undercard. And Melendez lost, but you can't argue that he's not a good fighter. He may be damaged goods, but this is still a massive step up for Kitrov. And look at Kitrov because this is a middleweight. If he wins this fight, this puts him at probably the level, maybe slightly below where Eubank is at. And now we have another middleweight on the horizon rising up. And in a year now, from now, if Golovkin is still at middleweight and Kitrov progresses as he's progressed, you have another 
viable opponent for Golovkin where you might say that might be one of the best fights you can make in the sport. Yeah. You guys have anything yeah, to say Yeah, uh, No, I, I'll, I'll look out for them. So cheers for the tip. I'll uh, keep my eyes peeled. But yeah, mid- middleweight is an exciting division. And there's people that are unhappy that they think that Golovkin has done all that he can do in, in middle. But there's so many talented people coming up that I wouldn't mind necessarily if he did stick around to, to you know, uh, fight some of these new up and coming people. Yeah, absolutely. I, That's I what agree. I've been saying. Yeah, is he could just stick at middleweight, let them battle it out for a chance for a fight with Glovkin. I mean, there's so much talent coming up right now. It's a very talent rich division at the bottom end of it right now. It's going to yeah. sort itself out. Well and truly and think, reset that division. Yeah, and I think a lot of divisions are like this. Where and it's a lot about the, it's a lot with the the sort of knee jerk reaction that we have as fans sometimes where once it looks like there's nobody on the horizon, the division is dead. There's no hope for it. If you're at, if you're in that division and good, you might want to consider moving up to join the next division because this one is not where it's at. And divisions reload pretty quickly. It wasn't long ago before we were saying that Sergio had nobody to fight and everybody in the middleweight division was garbage. And I think if Golovkin hangs around for about one more year, there's a plethora of opponents there for him to fight. All right, let's start wrapping this up. And I wanted to ask you guys about um, Simon's favorite fighter and my favorite fighter. So Andre Ward and Carl Frosch. <laughs> By the way, Andre Ward is actually not my favorite fighter, but I do like Ward, and I hate when people accuse me of loving Ward. They were ordered to fight each other by the WBA. You now love my question. <laughs> uh, you want me to hang up on you, Jason? <laughs> Please don't just <laughs> go. Uh, so is this a necessary fight at this point in their careers? Um, if you're both of those guys, what do you do right now? Do you well, – I mean, what do you do? Go Absolutely. ahead, Jason. You go first. I'll go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since you want to say that I love Ward. Oh, well, that puts me on the spot. Um, what does Ward do? Uh, I mean, can, can Ward even fight promotionally speaking at this point? Is he in a place uh, where yeah, everything Yeah, his contract was bought out? out by Rock Nation. He's, a, okay. he's free to fight. So is Carl Frotch the guy that I want to jump back in with after a you know year-plus ring absence? Not necessarily. But is it a fight that boxing needs? No. Simon? Yeah, they both, they're both going to ignore the alphabet. Why, why, would, um, why would either of them take it? I think they both know what that fight looks like and what happens. Frotch wants his big heyday you know farewell fight because he, he's been really explicit about that man wants a vegas fight in a competitive bout that's going to be a nice one to go out on he, he hasn't i'm sure he's gonna have no interest in in fighting ward in that, in that sort of environment ward probably won't want that fight either it doesn't doesn't do anything good for either of them really so you know they can be ordered all day, all day long that they've got to do this fight but i think they'll just ignore it and rightly so right i so. agree there's no reason for Ward or Frotch to listen to the WBA who's ordering this fight. <laughs> um, if I'm Ward, I'm even offended by the WBA because you guys are trying to strip me and give Frotch my title. And now you guys want to order me to fight like I'm his contender? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I think Frotch isn't too bothered either way whether they give him a, a belt or not on right, an Frotch, award. <laughs> What's yeah, this? Frotch uh, wants uh, Exactly, you know, another belt. I'll put it with the others. Like, you know, it, it it's not something that he's looking for right now. If it comes, I think it's just. And both guys, they're at the point in their careers. Same with Mayweather and Pacquiao, where belts don't really mean much. It's nice as a uh, sort of promotional tool, but their names alone are now the belt, where the belt yeah. is important for young guys. No, now it's the name. That. That's the way for Frotch is the point that I was just going to make is if we're talking a popularity contest, Frotch by and far wins that, you know, and Ward isn't necessarily going to be concerning himself with a belt, but Frotch has just got him beat whole handedly in the popularity contest. There's no reason for Frotch to go and take on Ward again. It just wouldn't make any sense. All right. Amir Khan. This is just like the British boxing podcast today. I love it. Amir Khan doesn't have a fight. And it's looking pretty likely that we might get something announced soon. I know Kodo is going to be announcing soon. Um, 
if you're Kondo, and let's assume that Mayweather wins on May 2nd, you know, actually, we don't even need to assume that. Um, assume that whoever wins the Mayweather Pacquiao fight wants Khan in September. Can you turn that fight down? As Khan? Yeah, you're Khan now. No, you can't turn that fight down. That's what you're waiting for. That's the reason you refused to fight in the past is because you felt a Mayweather fight was on the horizon. No, you're not going to turn that down. But in September, he's got oh, Ramadan Rob, concerns. Yeah. Well, so if that's what we're talking about, has he at any point said that he would be willing to take a Mayweather fight in September in the past? No. Probably. I mean, you know I'm he, not prepared he, for that question. I, well, he, I believe he has. He's, He's yeah. called out everyone on every date of every year ever. So I'm sure <laughs> somewhere in there he will have done that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I felt that he had said that he would be able to, you know, that he would be able to get permission from whatever religious figures he needed to, in order to be able to train or prepare for a September fight with Mayweather at one point in the past. If that offers made, he's saying, yes, there's absolutely nothing standing in the way of that. This is a guy who spent the last few years, on you know a baited fishing hook following this fight tempted but it's always just out of reach you know that that uh, ramadan's not even going to be a, a concern compared to the fight in terms of what it means for his career and priorities that's going to be an emphatic yes from him yeah if you're con you 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 convert to catholicism if you have to to get that just september for september fight. yeah, it, yeah absolutely. just for september yeah and i, I actually have. I'm asking you this question. I'm just setting you guys up because I just wanted to throw out this fact. The last time that Khan fought in September, when, where he normally doesn't fight because of Ramadan, was against Brady's Prescott. Yeah, he, 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 he's definitely taken that fight. And I think that he'll be mentally worried because of what happened with Prescott in September. And maybe he's linked that all in his head that, you know, training during ramadan puts him in a position that makes him vulnerable and he'll be worried potentially but all of those fears have to be allayed and that contract will get signed and he'll come up you know he, he will show up that's the most important thing for him is getting paid showing up i think how he does and what shape he's in and what his performance is is almost secondary it's get getting the money and getting the fight signed first getting the performance will be almost a, an afterthought yeah, I completely agree. I think if the fight is offered to him, he is going to take it regardless of the time of year or whatever religious obligations he might have to fulfill. Mm. Uh, very, very interesting and astute uh, research there, Angela, with figuring out that it was the Prescott fight. Very interesting. Well, what can I say? Um, we have boxing's return to national television this week here in America. Britain has been experiencing this recently, and they just got it again with Carl Frampton. Um, you know, he was fighting on ITV, which is like our channel four and our channel seven or whatever. I don't actually don't even know what channels you are. I live in LA. Those are the channels here. So are we entering like we meaning boxing entering like a new era in the sport? And should we be thanking Al Heyman? I don't think it's entirely Al Heyman, but yeah, there's, there's some credit due and it is moving back. I think into the public eye, I've got people you know, friends and family and extended people that know how involved I am with boxing, reaching out and saying, oh, this card that's on this weekend is that one that's worthwhile to watch. And there's people that typically won't watch much. They're starting to watch more. And you can see it is spreading again in and finding a wider audience base, certainly here, certainly in my you know direct experience. But I, it's got to be linked with, you know, we, we've had... Jimmy Lennon Jr. and Buffer were both in the UK this weekend. One of the cards on, you know, free public TV that everyone's got access to at a reasonable hour of the night. You know, it's it it's only it makes sense and adds up that that's going to be bringing popularity back and bringing intrigue back. So yeah, I think we are entering a a, a bigger era in terms of fandom. So I think that we're going to have a lot of uh, new boxing supporters showing up over the next six months to eighteen months. Yeah, I just want to say, get, oh. Buffer loved Belfast. If you watch that again, Buffer loved it. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I was going to, not to get derailed, but the um, the crowd at the Frampton fight, pound for pound, best crowd of the <laughs> year so far. I mean, oh, yeah. 
they were fantastic, even when it was, you know, 20 minutes between bouts and they were playing, uh, you know, Ellen John's The Piano Man. The entire arena was singing in unison. It's just fantastic. <laughs> I don't want to get uh, sidetracked with that. Uh, yeah, I think boxing is entering somewhat of a renaissance period in the United States where we're uh, being back on network television. And I think we spoke to this a little bit on the last podcast, but, you know, I work with a lot of people in an office setting. A lot of them are talking about the Mayweather-Pacquiao fight, to me specifically. So, you know, anecdotally, I'm seeing a lot of people just getting very interested in that one fight. Everybody that talks to me about it, the first thing I mention to them is uh, PBC. Hey, did you know that uh, boxing is also going to be on NBC leading up to this? Like, you could catch a couple more fights that will be really interesting. So, just the way that Heyman's timed that in order for us hardcore boxing fans to tell other people about it, hey, it's free over the airwaves, uh, I think uh, we're entering a little bit of a renaissance. Al Heyman would probably say right now, thank you, Jason. <laughs> thank I, um, you. My bank I agree, account though. number is 10245. <laughs> I, I, I do the same thing, though, when people ask me about boxing because I'm getting a lot of people asking me about it. And I did get one today, though. I had, a, I had somebody come up to me and they said, hey, uh, May 2nd, Pacquiao, he's going to fight um, Merriweather. Oh, Merriweather, that's the uh, fictional that's, bad guy group yeah. from GTA Five. Yeah, they're like a, <laughs> they, were, they were like the private um like Blackwater sort of thing, right? Right, the private government contractors, yes. Yeah, i I finished the game. I chose to shoot Trevor. I always save all three. I've played through it twice. You can save all of them? Yeah. How yeah. do you do that? Uh you go through this ridiculously hard mission. But we'll save that for our GTA five podcast. Oh my yeah, God. that's that's the Tuesday night GTA podcast. But yeah. um, yeah, did you show him a picture of uh, Timothy Bradley to set him straight? Or Hopkins? <laughs> <laughs> Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. is training with Joe Goosen now. You guys have yeah, any thoughts one, on this it? one? Uh, no, I don't know what I think about it other than it's weird. Yeah, there, it doesn't seem like a good match. Yeah, I mean, Goosen seems like an actual trainer. That doesn't seem right. Right, like a guy who's not going to take crap. Like a guy who's not going to be okay with him getting stoned, wearing pink undies, and eating cereal all night long. Is that some sort of slide on Freddie Roach, uh, trainer of the year the last eight years running? Uh... <laughs> all right, so we're going to skip this one. Um, just one word answer, guys. So unmute yourself and get ready to answer this one. Pascal is very competitive. Was that the answer? No, it's uh, do you care about who's being chosen as a sparring partner? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess the answer was yes. Um, one <laughs> sentence, right? One sentence. You guys each get one sentence. Vasily Lomachenko versus Gamalier Rodriguez. Go, Jason. Who's he fighting? Okay. Gamalia, yes. Simon? Rodriguez. That no, that's my answer. Yeah. Who's it? <laughs> it's not a terrible answer, is it? Um Yeah, I, I think you'll get what you expect, won't you? It, it's like I don't I don't know. There, there's a lot of um Lomachenko's excellent and he's gonna do this, that they seem very cautious with who they're matching against. And this isn't someone that carries a big big deal of credibility at the weight, so I'm not sure exactly what they're doing. Is this a placeholder fight? I don't know. They're putting on a Mayweather versus Pacquiao undercard, so it must be important, right? Well, this is it. April... I, I think it, it, it's it's got. I can only think that they've thought, who can he absolutely smash and get everyone on his side? So they've brought in someone who is just going to get knocked out in a huge way, and the fact that they're not a particularly strong opposition will hopefully be lost on a, a great deal of the audience who just see a knockout artist and think, brilliant, I'll follow that guy. Yeah, of course. They want to have somebody who's going to have a breakout performance, and they want to have somebody do something explosive, entertaining, and something that's going to suck fans in. And that seems like the fight that we got, possibly. Mm. Barring any hand injuries from uh, Loma. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little disappointed by the pick because you have such a massive platform, and I get the the logic behind it of put on a showcase. Everybody will see that this guy is fantastic. But why Lomachenko? But why exactly. Lomachenko? I don't know. 
That's a it really good no question. Sense. Why Lomachenko? And we'll save that for the next episode because I want to run through these last two things. Terrence Crawford versus Terrence Dulorme, April 18th. Thomas Dulorme. Um, you think he's going to win? Oh, without a doubt. Because I know you, and I don't think you think he's going to win. Oh, shut up. No, he's absolutely going to win. Yeah, no, I have complete faith in Crawford. I don't, I don't see anybody uh, troubling him too often. And uh, he's going to – he'll he'll do fantastic. That was not the sign that we need to get off the phone. That was somebody getting a text message for those of you who don't have iPhones. Simon, what do you think? Is this like I think this is a massive step for Crawford. And I know we've seen him fight at 140 and be, do well, but Dulorme has been like doing like he his stock has been steadily rising. And with Robert Garcia, he's looked really good, except for his yeah. last fight, which he looked okay. It's gonna be one of those ones that on paper you think ah. Oh. What a milestone fight, and I think that Crawford's going to walk through it with absolutely no sweat broken, and it's going to be one of those ones that makes you take stock and realize yet again just how special Crawford is. Hell yeah, Simon. <laughs> so y'all must have forgot, because Roy Jones Jr. is fighting this Friday against 14, 8, and 2 Willie Williams. If you live in North Carolina, look it up because you <laughs> got to go see that fight. Y'all must have forgot. That's it for this episode. I don't know if Roy Jones is going to do a rap performance afterward. I really do hope so because it was great last time when he knocked out the guy in uh, Hungary or Turkey. I don't know if... Um, uh, i got to look this up, actually, because this is funny. Egypt is the last one, wasn't it? Was uh, it Egypt? Let me look this I up. It was, yeah. I, for some reason, I thought it was Russia. No, it was Russia. So you guys, yeah, it was, it was oh, I remember. So well, it's not hey, going to be like his last fight. I never fight. get anything right. It was, Henny, uh, it was amazing, Adio. though. He put on an, an epic performance in his uh, post-fight rap from the ring. It was just great. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Jones, Jones looked fantastic during that rap. Um, he, I mean, he looked like he was in his prime. <laughs> his prime rap. That's it for this episode. What, what, is there any other prime that we would talk about? On this podcast, no. <laughs> That's it for this episode. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you for listening again. We we decided to record this one a little later today. It's like 3 a.m. for Simon or 4 a.m. or something. It's actually 5 a.m. it's coming up to now. Okay, well, my math isn't as good as it is, as it was, as it is earlier in the day. It's like 8.38 for me at night. I still have a lot of night left. Um, Simon's got to get up for work. And uh, Jason's going to, I don't know what Jason's going to do. I think he's going to go watch Terrence Crawford videos. <laughs> <laughs> that um, was all right, funny. guys. Simon, Jason, thanks for joining me. Um, given the ridiculous circumstances that we've recorded this podcast, I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Y'all must have forgot, 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 forgot. When they broke my gold medal in Seoul, Korea, let's look back at my whole career. Because y'all must have forgot, forgot, forgot. The best pound for pound is mine Hit Percy Harris with four hooks at one time